Happy Sabbath, and welcome to the 10th lesson of the third quarter of the Teens Cornerstone Connection lesson of 2023. This week, we have Baraka on the mission story. In the orchestra, we have Amy and Ariana on the violins, Sakai on the trumpet, and Sid on the piano. For the lesson panel, we have some of the Nairobi Central teens along with their teen teachers. Enjoy! Happy Sabbath. As previously mentioned, my name is Baraka and I'll be taking you through the mission story for this Sabbath. The mission story comes from the country of Latvia and we know it's not a country that's talked about a lot, so if, in case you don't know, it's located in Europe, specifically on the Baltic Sea. It has a population of 1.884 million people and the capital city is R Riga, yeah. Um, so the story is about a little girl called Anna who loves Jesus a lot. She loves Jesus to the point where her mom would often call her like a little missionary, like a small missionary. She, she's not sure when she started this love for Jesus, but she could trace it back to about when she was five years old. At some, at some point, she was in the car with her friend and her mom, and they were driving, and her friend was misbehaving quite a lot. She was fidgeting, moving around. She was making a lot of noise. And meanwhile, Anna was just calmly staring at her. And then out of the blue, Anna asked her, like, Jesus is coming soon. Are you behaving in the correct way? And this made her friend pause for a minute and begin to think. And then she asked the question, how is Jesus coming? When is Jesus coming? And why is Jesus coming? Although Anna was only five years old, she attempted to answer these questions to the best of her ability. She said, Jesus is coming in a cloud of white, as it says in the, in the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verse 7, which says, Behold, he is coming with a cloud, and every eye shall see him. Her friend had also asked, When is Jesus coming? To which Anna replied, Even though we don't know the exact time that Jesus is coming, we know he's coming soon, sooner than later. And after this, this sparked continuous conversations between her and her friend about Jesus. And as a result, um, her friend's entire family would eventually get saved. They would all give their hearts to Jesus and get baptized, thanks to Anna's missionary. And so part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help children in Latvia, learn more about Jesus and his soon coming. The offering will help construct a building in Latvia's capital, Riga, where pathfinders and other children can get to know Jesus. Thank you for this generous offering. We encourage each and every one of us to give wholeheartedly so that they may be able to build this so that more and more children, like Anna, can get to know more about Jesus. Before I close, I'd like to say a small prayer for this 13th Sabbath offering so that it may be successful. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of life and everything you've given us. Dear God, I'd like to pray that you may please bless the 13th Sabbath offering so that more children like Anna may get to know about Jesus and spread the message of your soon coming. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Song 531, we'll build on the rock. Such an amazing song uh, to start with the lesson uh, of discussion for today's lesson. Uh, today we have a very interesting uh, lesson, which is all about uh, the real estate section. Before we jump into our, our lesson discussion of the day, I would like us to start with a, a word of prayer by my brother, Sid. Our Father, uh, what in heaven, we come before you this beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you for the gift of life, for your guidance, your protection, and for all the things that you have done to us. Lord, as we start this lesson, I pray that you may help us understand, for this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, before we, uh, we jump to the lesson, I would like us to introduce ourselves from my far left. Good morning from wherever you are. I am Salmon. Hello, my name is Ashley. And I'm Sid. And uh, my name is Senet Mose. I'm going to be one of the facilitators for the, for the show. Uh, before we go into the lesson, uh, we've just heard a very, very amazing song like, uh, We'll Build on the Rock. And this, uh, it's one of like, uh, my favorite uh, songs. Like, um, Jesus is the rock. If like, we'll uh, stretch ourselves to the point of like, trusting in him, then it's going to show us like, this is my place, this is the land for you, I want you like to inherit. For when we look at the lesson we have today, the real estate section, what do you understand by the word uh, like a uh, real estate section, Sid? Of my, my understanding of real estate is, you know, uh, the, like a housing like um, company. So like, you be, like they build a house, then you can buy a house from like that specific company. Or maybe just um, a company that manages assets, like yeah. the LNG White estate manages all the assets of the LNG White family. Yeah. Salman? Yeah, I think real, est real estate is generally managers or a company which builds houses, just as it says. And then they build it in a specific area. So like the real estate section is the area where they're going to bring up the estate where guys can come and buy the houses. Yeah. Thank you so much. All your answers are correct. But in this case, we're looking at uh, one of uh, the best uh, stories of my life for me, if I can say. We're looking at one character in the Bible who happens to be Kale. We all know like the role he played uh, when actually they were sent by, by Moses to be the spies, to, to go and see the land. Uh, Caleb was one of the guys who came and then he gave a, a positive um, feedback, whereby all the other guys, they were like, no, as for us, we cannot go into that land because of the reasons they gave. But Caleb stood and said like, no, that place is a good place, and he gave uh, an honest answer to Moses. Due to his uh, honesty, we see him like being uh, rewarded something at the end. And one of the things that he was given, it was land. For him, it was like, he was promised. That way, he, he told Joshua, like, give me this land. This is what I want. Yeah. And then when we talk about like, uh, the real estate uh, section, this is what we're looking at. Like now, the Israelites have uh, reached in Canaan, and now they are taking possession of the land. The, the, and when you look at the lesson, it's like every person was possessing the land according to his faith. So if you had a small faith, then the place like you were to possess was to be, to be small because they were promised by God. And then it brings us into, into the Seventh-day Adventist uh, fundamental beliefs, number 14, uh, which says like unity in the body of Christ. What do we understand by unity in the body of Christ, Ashley? Unity is one is something that Christ underlined when he was on earth and he asked us no matter what differences we have, no matter how much truth is distorted, we need to keep in mind always the fact that we should um, correct one another but keep unity as our baseline. No matter who goes astray, we should just... Um, 
bring them back with patience and understanding and keep unity as our baseline. Because the moment when there is disunity among us, then the devil can work among us and do a number of things. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Salmon. Okay, so I think from the Sunday section, the Sunday sec, the Sunday section, which is into the story, we have uh, Joshua. Uh, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb said to Joshua, uh, "Forty years ago, we were here with Moses, and." We stood, we were sent as 12 spies to study the land, but only me and you came with good report of the land. We stood firm, and God told Moses, the people will have to go around. And we went around still having strong faith, and Caleb added that. The strength I had 40 years ago, now that I am 85, I still have the strength to fight for the name of the Lord. So... Joshua gave, blessed Caleb and gave him inheritance, land in Hebron. So they had conquered all these cities. So the Lord told Joshua, designate the cities for refugees. In case someone killed a person accidentally or unintentionally, they will go to the cities, stand before the gate, and tell, and tell it to the priests of the city, to the elders of the cities, and tell them that what they tell them what they did. So the elders will let them in, and when one of their kin will come for revenge for the guy who was killed unintentionally, the elders are not to give this person. I think from this section we learn that God really cares about everyone, even murderers, even to this day. No matter what you've done, there's still refuge in God. And so, after all that, after everything was commissioned, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites in Shiloh and crossed over the Jordan back to Gilead, their own land. So they built an altar there. Then the, uh, the Israelites came to Joshua and told him, oh, the Israelites uh, made an army. They wanted to fight the Reubenites, Gadites, and the tribe of Manasseh because they built an altar, thinking that they had built it for the gods. But the Reubenites, Gadites, and tribe of Manasseh defended themselves, saying, we built the altar so that when, you are, when our descendants uh, are here, they won't say that, what do you have with the Lord? Everyone will say this is the altar which was built here, just showing that we worship the same God and we have faith in the same God. And so they named the altar a witness between us that the Lord is God. Amen. 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 Sid, what do you think? So uh, we are going to the what do you think section, and uh, we are going to either agree or disagree with uh, the following. It is better to try and fail than to have never tried at all. Agree. Personally, I, I think I'll agree with this. Because you know how when you were small and you didn't like eating vegetables, your mom would tell you, so you're not going to try, then you won't know it's nice. Then you'll try it, then you're like, oh, okay, this is actually nice. So I, I, I feel like it's better to try and fail than to never have tried at all. Because um, even putting aside food opportunities in life, you would try and fail, but you would have gained experience, or you will try and succeed. So if you never tried, then you'd have never had the opportunity to succeed. They say experience uh, is the best teacher. Yeah. So it's good to try, you fail, and then at the end you'll get the results like you want. Uh, Salmon, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. You agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Number two, Sid. The second one is the most well-intentioned effort will ultimately fail without God's blessing. I'm going to have to agree with this because with God, nothing is impossible. So like, if you if you take God out of it, it's it's impossible. It may not be necessarily impossible, but it does not... It doesn't bear the blessing of God and therefore you're all alone. It's like it's like um going to university and you're learning maybe let's say architecture. But you're teaching yourself all by yourself, no one to guide you, no teacher, like worse than the person who discovered it, you know? So there's nobody who's been there who's had the experience or who's teaching and telling you turn left because if you turn right you will mess up. So I think that's what God's blessing is and much more. Yeah, I think this relates to the story of the ten virgins. Why have had enough oil and oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. The you have God but don't but then you don't have God at every time. Is a time the Holy Spirit leaves you, so you are all by yourself. They missed the uh, uh, interpretation means that they they missed heaven just because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Here you may miss your target. You may achieve some things, but you may miss your target because you did not have God as your guiding light. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and uh, it relates to the to the story of uh, of Caleb. Uh, when they went like to spy for the land, uh, in the eyes of the other guys, they were like, you know, we cannot like possess this land, yeah. But for Caleb, he was like, we have like the blessings of the Lord. We have been sent by the Most High God. So then, what's so hard for him that he cannot like give us? So for him, it was positive because he had faith in him, like God is going to to guide us, and we are going to have this land. So through that faith and believing like God's blessings are with us, that's why we see him like at the end, it was like this is the land. Many people, they were like, we cannot get it. That's why he was like telling uh, Joshua, like for me, like give me this land. Because it's something like God's blessings is with us. God has guided us up to this particular point. Mm -hmm. So it's good like, when you're doing something, always like put God first. Because God's blessings will help you like, to achieve whatever uh, things you want to have in life. Yeah? The third one is even the flattest pancake has two sides. It's a fact. You don't even have to agree with it. It's a fact. <laughs> but it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Meaning that anyone you meet in this life, as much as you think you know them too, too well, there's just that other side you yeah, have no are. idea about. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all agree with that. Uh, the next one is general unity is more important than absolute agreement. Very true. We can never agree on everything. We are diverse. God created us, created us differently with different uh, views to life, approaches to life, personalities. Therefore, you can disagree, but you can be unified. Your yeah. disagreement doesn't have to cause disunity among. Someone, anything? No. Okay. Uh, the fifth one is you can't be too careful. Uh, hey, you can be too careful. You can't be too careful. I don't know. May You can be careful. You can also be too careful yeah. to see what your averse or what it is that is making you want to be careful. Like you'd put your guard so so high up that you're focused on the guard so much that you forget the thieves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, what I say is no risk, no reward. So you just have to take the risk. You just have to take yeah. the risk to move on. Yeah. Uh, the, the next one is if we attend church and don't do anything too sinful, our, our salvation is secure. I'm, I'm disagreeing with this. Yeah, I what's, totally disagree what's, what's, 
what what is the measure of sin? What is too sinful and sin. less sinful? You know, what's the measure it's of sin? It's all the same. Yeah. It's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next, the next one is, there's no sin God can't forgive. Very true. Very true. And it's be, like if you get to the point where God cannot forgive your your sins, it's because you have constantly denied the Holy Spirit until it's no longer convicting you of sin. Therefore, you your conscience is seared, yeah. and you do not, you cannot tell what is right and what is wrong. And uh, the final one is we should be patient and considerate even with those who attack us. It's really hard, but that's what the Bible says. That's what you should strive to do. Even though it's very hard, I can't imagine someone who I can't tolerate disturbing me. I'm not patient to the person. Yeah. yeah. So I think we should just strive to be patient to these guys and bring them to God. But, but also I think, uh, if we want maybe to win these people into the kingdom of God, then like, I, I feel like our character should like, uh, show much love unto them to a point whereby they feel like, yes, I did something wrong to this lady, but she is like always there for me. She's there like, to help me to do all the things maybe I want to do. I think only that is the only thing that can be able to bring these people unto the kingdom of God. Even so, righteousness is not cowardice. You cannot always be wrong then because you're Christian. Just be, just allow people to trample upon you. And that also reminds me of a quote I thought about, I don't know, or I had somewhere, that says, in life there are more misunderstandings than understandings. So you're prone to be misunderstood more than understood. Therefore, if you're... Um, violent to the one who misunderstands you, then you'll never be at peace. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Sid. So maybe we move to the Sunday part. Um, Salmon, can you take us through the, the Sunday part? Okay, so in the out of the story, we have a few questions which we need to answer. Was it important that Caleb approached his old friend Joshua with a group of other tribes tribes members to ask for Hebron, why might Joshua, from prior experience, have been particularly concerned about public perception and opinion? Um, Joshua knows these people. He's been with them. He's known their fathers. You know how quickly they can turn against you and how quickly they can start to mum and how they can never be quiet. And he's been through all the heresies and the coups and everything that has happened in the camp of Israel. So he, he, he seeks to demonstrate to the public that this is just not about my personal relationship with Joshua. This is not about the fact that he's the one person who's been with me all these years. We figured out Canaan together. We brought back the good reports together. We've been leaders together, and now he's asking for this mountain of Hebron. But it was, if we did the key text, the key text is Joshua 14, 9. It says, So on that day Moses saw to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So this was a reward to Caleb from God because he strengthened the faith of Israel amidst the amidst everyone who was trying to bring them down he was there to stand up for that which is right yeah, yeah. and also maybe it was uh, maybe a sign of unity that they went like all of them like there to go and then claim because it was like something that was promised to him so when he went to approach uh, Joshua he went not uh, Demanding. To get demanding actually, like for him to be given, it was like a humble request. It's like something you have worked for. Yeah, that's where he went. And also it, uh, it brings out something very nice. It's all about unity. He went not for himself, but for the people around him. Mm. So this went, uh, another, we, we see like the, that uh, unity in the body of Christ. It's another character we see in, in 
Caleb. Mm -hmm. I, I'm coming here not for my sake, but I'm coming here for the sake of the people around me. Yeah. So if I'm going to get this land, then my people also should get something out of it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also the this 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 the, the the land that he asked to subdue was of the Anakites, and the Anakites are the, are the ones who had caused the faith of the Israelites to dwindle and to lose stand because they thought they were grasshoppers and these were giants. So he somewhat sought revenge. Ellen White says that by faith, Caleb addressed every giant, the very giants whose power had staggered Israel's faith. And those who did not believe, who were like, no, we are grasshoppers, we cannot conquer this land, they saw their fears come to life and they all died in the wilderness. Yeah. We'll skip a few and we'll just do one more. Uh, why will God appoint cities of refuge rather than ban private vengeance altogether? Let's just answer that, the first part of the third question. Why will God appoint cities of refuge rather than just ban private vengeance altogether? You know, he cannot go against his word. Romans um, 3.23, if I'm not wrong, says that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Therefore, he cannot take away the punishment of the law after you have sinned. He can only give you grace and pardon to say it was unintentional, therefore... <clears throat> I don't have to be killed because I did not mean to kill the person. It maybe I was working and something hit him and he died. It was unintentional. Therefore, he gives us grace and a second chance to live even after mistakes have been done. Yet the scene of murder, the scene of murder was he 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 said that whoso sheddeth a man's blood by Man, his blood shall be shed. If you kill by the sword, you will die by the sword. Yeah. So that was pretty important, not to abolish the law. But also I think like, uh, it's like God had a plan for these people all along from, uh, from Egypt. The first time was seen like, a time maybe looking at the generation of Abraham and all that. It is something like for him, he had a plan for these people. So, Whatever like he was doing, it's because he knew like what was going to be good for them, not good for individuals, but good for like something that is going to please him. Mm -hmm. That's why like it was like maybe these people they need like maybe to get out of this place because that's the land you deserve, you know. So you cannot say like come and possess this estate, something like like you have not worked for. It's like it, it brings something and then it gives it to you. You will not value this thing. True. But then again, something like you have worked so hard for. Once you get it, you will value that place. Even look at Caleb, it was like, this is the place I want. It's the place, like, every person was like, for me, I cannot go into that place. Look at the people who are occupying the place. They were big, they were like giants. But Caleb was like, that's the place I want. He believed, he had faith, like, my God is going to see me through, and I'm going to have it. So it also builds, like, our character as Christians, like, you want something, you have to work for it. Challenges are going to be there. But what do you do? You must have faith and believe in the most high God. Like, it's going to see me through until the point I'm going to possess this thing. In the, in the flashlight section, it says that Caleb did not ask for himself a land already conquered, but the place which above all others, above all others, the spies had thought it impossible to subdue. To each was given according to his faith. The unbelieving had seen their faith fulfilled. Notwithstanding God's promise, they had declared it was impossible to inherit Canaan, and they did not possess it. But those who trusted in God, looking not so much to the difficulties to be encountered as to the strength of their almighty helper, entered the goodly land. And as I've mentioned a few minutes ago, he... He had faith, enough faith to know that the giants that were living on this mountain would be conquered. And for me, I think it's a good form of revenge. As much as the Bible says the vengeance is for the Lord, he, he uses this promise to take away 
those who made the faith of Israel to dwindle. And he's, he's been through with them for the last 40 years. He's now 85. They've been complaining. They've had plagues, snakes, you know. And he's not, he's not complaining and saying, do you know, if it, were, it was dependent on me, we'd be in this land a long time ago. You guys and your unbelief is the reason we are still here. You know, so I find Caleb really humble and I find Joshua also a bit wise when dealing with Caleb, knowing that the Israelites can say, oh, you're showing favoritism, it's because it's your own brother and all these things. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, let's move to the Monday part. Sid, maybe you take us through the, the Monday part. So the Monday part is the key text. The key text comes from Joshua chapter 14, verse 9. Uh, verse nine. Uh, someone, maybe you can read that one for us. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing because we are seeing a situation whereby God is rewarding the people because of uh, having total belief in him. They had faith in him like uh, if we believe in God, then God is going to show us the way like he's not going to leave us. And then it's something that comes into us Christians, you know. There are so many promises that God has promised us, you know. If you remain faithful to me, then this is what I'm going to do. If you work so hard in class, then these are the rewards that we are going to get. So it, it, it's a good thing that uh, God is showing us through the, the Israelite story. Like, we have only one God. And for us, maybe to achieve the things that we want, we only have to believe in him and have total faith in him. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we can be able to Overcome. conquer the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to the punchlines where everyone can choose one. And just see how it speaks to them personally. I'll start. Mine is Psalms 46, verse 1. God is a refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. I really love to read verses like this the ones that give you strength and hope. Knowing no matter what difficulty you're in, there's a God who's there for you waiting for you to go over, leading you through. So, yeah. I'd choose 2 Samuel 22, verse 23, which says, The Lord is my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people, you save me. This points to the cities of refuge that God built, and Christ is our refuge. He shelters us from the from the um, consequences of sin or from sin itself, and he takes us away from violent people. You know, if I were to kill someone today, their close relatives of these people would want me dead, right? Would they give me days to whether I test whether it is right? As long as they think I killed the person, they want me dead, no matter the rumors, no matter... So the cities of refuge were there within a half a day's journey of everywhere. So that the moment you know that you kill this person accidentally, you run. With that speed, we should also run to the Savior because the devil is there trying every way to tempt us. And as soon as he tempts us, he pulls us into his camp and says, yeah, God cannot love you because you already did this. So I, I, I love the part that says, from violent people, you save me. Um, I, I would pick Psalm chapter 91 uh, verse 1 it says whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the, in the, of the almighty I, I like this verse because you know it, it, it gives me hope mm -hmm. that you know if you dwell in the shelter uh, like God will give you rest like uh, I, I I remember this verse. Um, it's it's something like, "Come ye who are heavy laden, heavy landed, landed, and, I'll, and give uh, I'll give you rest." Mm. So you know it it you know it gives me hope that 
whenever life gets tough, maybe I'm, I'm struggling, I'm reading, and I'm not understanding what's, what, what I'm reading. So like, I, I, it gives me hope that whenever I go to God, he will, he will for sure give me rest. Amen. Amen. For me, I'll also take uh, Psalms 40, 46, verse 1. Uh, which says, uh, God is our refuge and the strength, an ever-present help in trouble. For me, I'll just look at uh, like the whole story, uh, the one uh, from Egypt and, and then to the place where they are right now, settling in, uh, in Canaan. We see like uh, there was a lot of things happened in the wilderness all the way from Egypt and all that. But all this time, like God was ever, ever, ever present um, with, uh, with these people. At no any given point, uh, they were like, God, we have called you and you have not answered our prayer. God was always there. Every time Moses was like, God, this is what the people are crying for. And God will always provide solutions. Uh, God will always provide for them. So it tells like, life is not going to be all about uh, walking the path. But also there are those times when you feel like um, things are not working or maybe there's trouble in whatever you're doing. But God is there telling us, like, the only thing that you need to do is just to, to look unto me, to fight for what you believe in. If it's the Bible, then go for it and show the world, like, you know what? God is here. God will answer our prayers if we believe in him and then have total faith in him. Amen. Um, that takes us to the Thursday part. And to the Tuesday part, I will just ask us a few questions. And the questions I would ask don't need an answer. But I'd like each one of us to think through this. And it says that in much of life, attitude is everything. The Israelites' self-defeating attitude left, led to defeat. Joshua's courageous faithfulness brought God power to success. What is God encouraging you to do? And what giants are in your way? How can you focus on what God will do through you and not just the obstacles in your way? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 and 24, I'd ask Sid to read for us. Hebrews 10, 26, sorry, 26 and 27. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. 26 and 27. 26? Um, sorry, 22 and 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 and 24. It says, let us draw near, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then 24, like 22, 22, 23, and 24, or just 22 and 24. This 22 and 24. 24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to, and, and, to, and to good works. Yeah, let's consider one another in love and provoke each other to good works. Um, the Israelites at some point thought about the, had heard about the Reubenites and the, and the altar they had built, and this was, this was provoking them, and they were feeling like, you know, we should kill them. They've already made a mistake. Don't they know what happened in the wilderness? Don't they know what happened after they had created a calf? Don't they know how many people died? They were already quick to judge and quick to think about the consequences of what they had done without really knowing and being given an explanation. So while we are not to sacrifice one principle of truth, it should be our constant aim to reach this state of unity. Where now they asked the question, why did you do this? And they were just told that it is a memorial and on the altar it was inscribed that it is a memorial lest anyone should um, worship on this altar. So a spirit of kindness, a catcher's forbearing department may save the erring and hire 
the multitude of sin. So that even under false accusation, those in the right can be calm and considerate. And by this, we can draw others to Christ. Thank you, thank you so much. And now we are moving on to the, the Friday part which is uh, like marking the, almost the end of our lesson for, for today. Uh, maybe I can uh, invite Sid to read for us uh, Matthew 24, 9 to 14. Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 to 14. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall, uh, shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this, gospel, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all that world for a witness unto nations, and then shall the end come. Amen. Actually, looking at this story, one of the things uh, we're learning from uh, the real estate section is that sometimes uh, we as Christians, uh, when we decide like we want to follow uh, Christ, there are a lot of things that we, we normally face along the way. But one thing that uh, should stick into our minds is like, God is always there to guide us. God is always there to show us the way. If only we can just have that belief in him that God uh, died for us and God is here to, show, uh, to lead everything we want to do. And the only thing that we need to do as Christians is to involve God in all the plans that we have. Sometimes along the way as Christians, we can lose our friends, we can get betrayed. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we stand uh, to, to know to gain when sure. uh, we, we want we to follow Christ. We stand to lose an yeah. obstacle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the only thing God is telling us is like, be firm on your faith. Have total faith in whatever you're doing. Because if someone deserves to have a good uh, retirement, then it's Caleb because mm -hmm. of the work that he did. And actually, God gave him because he felt like this young man has stood for the truth. He has done according to my will. What do I have to do? I have to give him a reward. And that's the only thing God is promising us. Like, let's turn to his word. Let's do according to his will. At the end of the day, when he comes for the second time, we will be the first people like, to see him on the sky like, coming, and then we we'll live with him forever because there's an estate for us in heaven. Amen. Not this worldly estate that we see here, but Amen. there's an estate in heaven that God is preparing for us. Maybe we can get our parting shots from from each and every one of us, and then we close. Salman. Okay, so I think for me, my parting shot is we should believe in God and know that He is our refuge and strength and will lead us through every difficulty that occurs in our life, just as He led the Israelites. I read the further insight and it says, by our unity, by esteeming others better than ourselves, we are to bear the to the world a living testimony of the power of truth. And also that First John 5 4 says that faith is a victory that overcomes the world. Our faith can help us conquer very many things. So I'd encourage each one of us to keep believing and having faith in God. Amen. Um, for me, I first want to correct something you said. I believe you said we shall be the first ones to rise up to go and meet Jesus in the skies. I'd like to correct that it's actually the dead in Christ that will rise first, mm -hmm. yeah, then yeah, yeah. we will rise after them. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to say that you know, when, whenever you feel troubled, just remember there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. And our light at the end of the tunnel is God, the Almighty. Yeah. Amen. For me, I'll say like uh, God uh, will empower us when we, we, we follow him. And uh, in closing, it says like every person was given according to his faith. It draws like again into us like we should have faith in him. When challenges are, we feel like they're too hard for us, the only thing that we need to do is to have total faith in him and believe that uh, he's going to deliver us and he's going to lead us all the way. Amen. So I would like to invite our Salman to have a closing prayer for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for helping us. 
read and understand this lesson and share it to the world. May you be with us, guide us and protect us. Forgive us our sins and trespasses. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Until next time, bye.